during the presentation, um, basically what we will do is I will give you a short uh, introduction uh, with respect to the background of uh, value chain analysis and uh, why it is uh, uh, becoming an important matter. And then I will uh, take you through the basics of value chain analysis, looking at uh, qualitative and quantitative value chain analysis. And then with respect to the quantitative value chain analysis, I will basically uh, expand um, the presentation a little bit to go into in depth um, the way we have uh, developed our um, analysis around taking a quantitative approach towards uh, the value chain. Um, so let's just then uh, turn the slide and let's go to slide number three and then four. So basically what what is uh, um, what was actually the basis for the, the current way of, of thinking around uh, value chain analysis? Um, we used to know the the uh, qualitative side of the value chain analysis, and um, through BEPS, we got more emphasis on um, uh, the quantitative side of value chain analysis. And and why is that? Because uh, there is more scrutiny on uh, basically uh, transfer pricing and how transfer pricing on the BEPS has evolved from a more um, contractual uh, driven um, environment to a more substance driven environment. So moving on to slide five. I think this is the, um, to set the stage a little bit from a tax risk management perspective and taking a holistic approach. So um, if you look at uh, the slides and let's go to um, the first box which shows uh, is a showed on the left side um, and you see financial data and that clicks using software and then basically it goes up from one to six. This is basically the, the, the steps you need to take from uh, staying out of trouble and uh, a, a common perception around we do this to compliance but we don't really um, take it uh, to the next level uh, and uh, we are in control of what we do. Um, in this regard, we have um, basically outlined six steps which basically get you from an staying uh, a passive stage to an basically in control stage. So if you look at first uh, financial data analytics using software, um, and this regard is, of, is, is one of the basics which starts with understanding the data you are basically using for your uh, documentation. And what could be very helpful there is if you can use uh, technology type of solutions in order to support you in um, organizing those data and selecting the data and scrutinizing the data on, uh, on out outliers. Then the second step is determining your um, your tax compliance and basically what are, where are you going to use your financial data for. Um, in most companies that would be for corporate income tax, VAT, master file, local file, uh, county by country reporting, uh, compliance matters. Then the third step is around risk planning and provisioning, ETR impact, um, and we can refer you as well to APAs and tax rulings. And this is very important in the, in the context of FIN48 and ACSC 74010. Uh, in essence, um, this is around uh, managing your um, tax risk from a P&L and, and, and balance sheet perspective. Um, and later you also will also um, reflect on what this means in the context of value chain analysis or which impact value chain analysis could have on, uh, uh, on this area. Then um, step four, align your text or align your substance in the operational uh, conduct um, and reflect it in, uh, in a RACI design type of matrix. 
So a, a RACI matrix is basically um, shown whom within your organization is responsible, accountable, uh, and needs to be consulted or informed. It gives you quite a good tool to uh, basically deal uh, efficiently with um, the amount of, of responsibilities and, and work which you are confronted with uh, during your day-to-day uh, -day work. Then uh, manage in-house challenges. Um, basically, it's around how you have basically staffed and organized your uh, your, organi your tax organization and whether you have the right uh, capabilities within that organization to, uh, to, to deliver and get to this uh, fully in control stage. So what you see nowadays uh, uh, quite often in, in, in tax uh, department is the entrance of um, IT based or IT skilled people, basically also then to support uh, for instance, point one. Then, uh, last but not least, um, clear, efficient communication to stakeholders. Now, here we can think about how we basically pile up all the work we do, yeah, and what is the output, and how does that reflect, and how do we uh, communicate it to our uh, superiors, to our, the CFO, to the CEO, to the board, and how do we reflect uh, on all these uh, elements which you have touched upon um, and are basically constituting our output and um, present that to the outside world. Yeah? And then we have to think about, for instance, reputational issues. Or maybe uh, you want to go public with, an, uh, uh, with your, with your uh, tax um, responsibility report. So this is a little bit in the, an overview of the, the tax landscape, um, and um, later I will try to clarify what VCA could mean for the different elements within this uh, tax landscape. So if you're looking at uh, um, tax, tax risk, um, and maybe bring it down to uh, something very simple. If you uh, were, if we were looking maybe five, six years ago, um, you are living in the in the in the triangle which you find on your left side, and then we dealt uh, basically within our work scope with economic reality, legal reality, and financial reality. And if that, if we could basically bring the three. In connection uh, to each other, then um, we basically uh, met our um, our legal objectives. Um, now, moving from pre to post steps, that triangle has changed, and uh, we are looking now to a triangle which basically looks from finance, tax, and team meet and transfer pricing model to operating model to cor corporate governance. Um, and corporate, corporate, corporate governance can also be basically replaced here by substance. These three elements come together in a, in a value chain analysis. Of course, we look at it from an, um, of course, we look basically at bringing substance together with your transactional transfer pricing model with, 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 and connect that with your business operating model. Next slide, please. So now moving on to the value chain analysis. Um, I think I already elaborated a little bit on the uh, on the importance of value chain analysis. This is also um, a little bit more uh, how to see uh, value chain analysis in the context of a more storyboard. So um, value chain analysis are basically the uh, stepping stone or the, the basis or should be the basis for your transfer pricing uh, documentation going forward. It has a an, uh, an, an profound impact on uh, um, many other aspects uh, which basically um, reflect on your daily work. So negotiations with tax authorities, um, if you are engaged in dispute resolution, if you want to explain something 
in your communication to the board or whomever that may be to other stakeholders, external or internal. So let us start then now with uh, the entering in depth more from technical perspective to discussing the, uh, the the topic. And I start with the, uh, the qualitative value chain analysis because these are the, the first step to take in the value chain analysis. Um, and um, let me then touch upon that. If you go to slide 10, basically uh, within the transfer pricing associate goal, we distinguish um, five steps. Step one is basically within the qualitative value chain analysis is to um, depict what the company basic entails of. And so you basically break out the company in uh, in, in different uh, uh, groups engaged in certain activities. Then you basically qualify or quantify or label these uh, groups of people and um, group them under functions. Then as the second step, you look at the company and uh, identify the risks which are associated within the company, within the, within the different functions and through the supply chain of the, of the, of the company. Then in step three, you basically look at what are the main assets of, uh, of a company, or what makes the, from an asset perspective, the company tick. Are these technology-related uh, intangibles, for instance, or marketing intangibles? And um, how do I need to um, yeah, value these, these assets in the context of, um, of the business? Then a step, step four based on the functional analysis and the risk profile, we basically uh, map these to um, responsibility profiles. And uh, in this regard, you can dis distinguish, uh, distinguish investment profiles, profit profiles, revenue and cost center profiles. Um, and I will touch upon those uh, later in the presentation. Um, but these are helpful to select, to guide you to select the appropriate transfer pricing and method. method. So, um, I put in two quite simple examples of a value chain analysis, and I, use, and I selected two, uh, two models, um, which we use. This is the P-chart model you're looking at. This is a very uh, simple model. It's also used in CBCR. And basically, it is uh, very easy to, uh, to use in your communications to, uh, to people which are maybe less experienced in uh, transfer pricing than you are. Because it very uh, quickly tells you where things um, may not be correct or may be misaligned. Um, Basically, it, uh, it gives you an, uh, an, an overview of the gross margin, the operating margin, and the full-time employees within this particular group. And, uh, and then you can basically, if you compare the, the, the pie charge, you can basically uh, notice that certain um, anom anomalies are taking place here. So if you look at it, for instance, if you look at the gross margin for the Netherlands with 33%, and an, uh, an operating margin of the Netherlands of 60%. You can uh, wonder why the Netherlands only has 6% of the total amount of employees. Um, that may be an, uh, an indicative for a misalignment uh, in the remuneration, or uh, in other words, a misalignment in the uh, value chain analysis. Um, uh, this is in, in, in slide in, in the sense that this is quite um, useful and um, to bring the message very easily uh, uh, across. 
Um, and it's also a, a, a way tax authorities are expressing or explaining uh, their information internally or to you as uh, if you are audited. Um, another approach is basically the, uh, the uh, Porter flowchart. So this this um, methodology, we start with determining here the, the total amount of, of IBIT. This is uh, reflected on the left side on the top. Then we uh, identify the key people functions and then the legal entities. Uh, to the key people functions, we have to make an allocation of, of, of IBIT and then you get an, an, an uh, allocation of people functions and IBIT to uh, a legal entity level. And the, uh, um, the amount of profits which is basically allocated, allocated it is determined by um, looking at the uh, first at the support functions um give, given those uh, uh, first the, their appropriate remuneration and then subsequently um, we will basically uh, allocate what is left to the uh, to the residual and um, then you can think about um, do I have here to do I regard this as an investment center and then in this case you then think about an IP owner or is it a proper center? And then we would think about a matchmaker, making personal matchmaker. If you're looking at the other type of support functions, then uh, I think most of you probably recognize uh, uh, the treatments like cost plus uh, for contract manufacturing, contract R&D, or resale miners for sales, which would be more of a supportive nature in, in uh, most cases. Um, to point a little bit more, more about the, the differentiator between residual, and then we make the uh, and we distinguish investment centers and profit centers. Then investment centers uh, would uh, typically reflect capital market customer driven activities, uh, mostly performed for stakeholders, and uh, um, part of the company's core activity. Then uh, profit centers are more reflected on uh, capital market customer driven activities performed for external customers, mostly core, and uh, we have to think about, for instance, distribution centers. If we are dealing with investment centers, it's very important that uh, um, we distillate the DEMPI functions. And for the uh, profit center, it's very different. They're very important to distillate the matchmaking. Um, okay, then I want to move to the uh, next um, topic within the value chain analysis, which is quantitative PCA. Um, we put in here a numerical uh, um, example, basically um, showing you an, um, an overview of, of a company with uh, locations in different countries. And um, the first part, up to a net up to net income, is reflecting a transactional model without a, a proper value chain analysis. And then the second part is basically reflecting you um, the um, EBIT um, and new alloc allocations of EBIT after the value chain analysis have been applied appropriately. Um, basically what you can, what you, what you will uh, see from these uh, figures and they are, of course, they are illustrative, but um, obviously if your value chain would not be uh, appropriately applied, then um, 
this would lead to significant changes in your uh, local and could lead also to your change in your total um, ETR basis uh, because you're looking at uh, different allocation of taxable income and therefore different, different tax rates. In addition, it has an, uh, an, an impact on your financial statements, not only locally yeah, from a statutory perspective and, and also therefore from a tax return perspective, um, which can give rise to issues with the local tax authorities. It also it gives rise to uh, um, probably FIN 48 issues in that you are uh, looking at uh, differences in um, what you reported from a transactional perspective and what you should have reported from a transfer parsing perspective. And then you will probably have to prevail uh, the, the transfer pricing value chain analysis um, and give a certain weighting to that. Uh, and the question is then whether you need to record something for PIN 48 or not. And last but not least, um, if things really go uh, sorrow, you could even have reputational issues. So if you're looking at looking at our quantitative uh, um, value chain analysis approach in more detail, um, Basically, it comes down to uh, supporting of the um, qualitative um, value chain analysis by quantitative analysis. And for that, we have developed a uh, new generation of benchmarks, which basically comprises uh, the following steps. Um, so we start. As I alluded to, with the uh, performance of the qualitative PCA, which includes, then, uh, as I also alluded to, the identification of key value drivers, functions, unique and valuable intangibles, assets, risks, risks efficiency, synergies, the DEMPI functions, and a an, uh, peer group comparison. And the latter is basically the, uh, the next, uh, very important for the next step. Because the uh, peer group analysis we will use to uh, identify the economical relevant variables for the particular industry in which um, the company is, uh, is acting. And it is done through an, uh, an, an correlation and regression analysis. Um, in this regard, we have uh, selected um, 15 variables which we basically use uh, to um, perform these analysis for different uh, type of industries. Um, as it's, what we will do in, in that regard is basically um, that we take an, an, an industry and uh, select the, the companies which are acting in such an industry. For instance, take for example uh, the automotive industry you would then select uh, the companies uh, like and I like uh, uh, Volkswagen, Mercedes, uh, Toyota, Toyota, General Motors, and we would then uh, uh, test whether the uh, uh, 15 variables can be consistently applied uh, over, over the industry. And uh, if that is the case, then we will um, test what then the outcome is, if there is a correlation between the variables, what that then uh, points to in terms of um, efficiencies or mostly profitability. And that can be depicted, we will see that later, uh, that can be plotted and then we can subsequently uh, look at the kind of uh, median which we will call, or what we are calling here, uh, the outcome of regression analysis. When we have done that and we know what basically the relevant um, variables are and what they mean for the profitability of such a company within the value chain, then we still need to think about um, how to allocate these outcomes to the uh, 
to a local legal entity level. Basically to see yeah, how we and how that uh, basically compares to what we have done from a uh, transactional perspective before we did then the value chain analysis um, or applied the value chain analysis uh, appropriately or properly. In order to uh, determine these allocation uh, keys, we have developed a methodology. Uh, basically, the methodology is, is, is uh, based um, on um, the quantification methods we use, as well as um, on BEPS itself. And um, the latter, to see whether we are BEPS com compliant, we have developed a uh, scoring model, which I will but we'll touch upon later as well. And if the results are uh, results of the data analysis are in line with the scoring model, we can basically say whether uh, the results from our analysis are in line with what PEPS requests. If we have found and have answered all these things, we, we can basically um, be assured that we have done a proper analysis, which we can uh, well, which will can be well documented from a um, from a uh, uh, numerical uh, and legal uh, perspective, and therefore uh, applied on the on the legal entity basis in support of the transactional um, methods applied. So basically what I uh, um, previously explained is uh, highlighted a little bit more here on this slide. So the quantitative VCA is presented as a corporate method for transactional transfer pricing. So we went through all the steps at the end of the day to, to build a uh, defense for what we apply uh, day to day um, on a legal entity uh, level. Um, and that has to tie back them to, uh, to our, our value chain analysis. Um, value chain analysis is not to be confused with the product split method. It's not, not the same. Uh, the whole approach at the end of the day is, is, uh, is, 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 is different and goes in much more depth. Um, if you look at our approach, we basically uh, uh, can break it out in uh, three main anchors. So the regulatory anchor, uh, regulatory anchor, anchor you can think about uh, um, certain countries which already men mentioned the uh, need to do value chain analysis in a quantitative fashion or qualitative fashion in their legislation. Um, the industry anchor, that's basically where I uh, talked about um, how to build our case from a numerical financial perspective. And then the BEPS compliant anchor, that is basically um, how to bring the results from uh, one and two back to a legal entity level by uh, using the proper allocation keys. Um, based on what we have done uh, above, we think that if you do it all, all the three steps uh, properly, then we, you have an objectified uh, value chain and uh, uh, a very good um, audit defense, VOV tax authorities, which should uh, basically result in, an, uh, in a clean audit trail um, and something which is difficult to uh, oppose to in court. So in a nutshell, um, we think that the new generation of benchmarks we are or have developed are basically giving you a BEPS compliant alignment between quantitative VCA and your current transfer pricing model. And one story of the truth because uh, you align your master file, local file, CBCR, and tax return. It is basically anchoring your value chain against that of your peers. And it is, an, uh, yeah, that we think a very powerful tool to convince tax authority that what you did was the right thing.
So then stepping a little bit, um, going a little bit more detail into the regulatory anchor. Uh, on slide uh, 19, you find basically um, extracts from the OECD transfer pricing guidelines uh, with respect to uh, allocation key fees. And I need, and I basically uh, um, will highlight some of the of the language here. Uh, allocation schemes are can be based, for instance, on incremental sales headcounts, number of individuals in, which are involved in key functions that generate value to the transaction. Time spent by a certain group of the employees if there is a strong correlation. So here you see also the word correlation. Uh, between the time spent and the creation of combined profit, the more server, data storage, etc., etc. Uh, the main takeaway here is if you can uh, show uh, or evidence um, that a certain profit is connected with a certain activity or a certain asset, um, then you have an, uh, uh, a good building block to use in your um, value chain analysis and then at the end as a defense for your overall transfer pricing policy. Okay. So moving to the industry anchor. Um, yeah, this is basically depicting in, from a fire, very high level perspective um, for instance, an, uh, an analysis within an industry. Here we have then, as an example, selected uh, six companies which uh, show uh, for the period 2014, 2016, and certain uh, area array. And uh, the point here basically is then, how can I connect the array, for instance, with the profit per uh, head? For the same period, is there can we find a correlation to evidence one with the other? Um, and to do that, basically, moving to the next slide, I selected a couple of these uh, examples. And um, also the source where they came from. So we have um, a variable one and a variable two. Um, sales fixed assets and cross margin. The correlation would then be if sales fixed assets ratio increases, the cross margin increases. If you look at um, EBIT employees, then correlation could be the number of employees increases, does the EBIT increase? And if you do the analysis, then you will find that in some industries that is indeed the case, and in some industries there is no no correlation at all. It seems to be that for automotive instance that is the case, but if you look at uh, uh, pharma, that that is not there is no co positive correlation. I also have mentioned here uh, an, an interesting article you may want to look at if you are interested to learn more about uh, variables. And that article, uh, um, based on forensic accounting, um, Stephen L. Curtis basically uh, uh, highlights various uh, variables which can be used to test the, the ratio uh, and the allocation of profits between uh, entities. Um, and Put it in the context of um, and economic models, and basically use these models to to say, okay, this makes sense and this doesn't make sense from an economic perspective, and therefore um, it is doubtful whether that allocation has been done by this and this company uh, appropriately. Then I also uh, listed here an, an very interesting study from the uh, Ministry of Econ Economy of Japan from 2004. 
uh, which basically um, uh, found certain correlations between R&D expenditure and return on equity, uh, intangible assets and sales, and tangible assets and sales. I mean, it may be very obvious, but it is the point here is basically that it is also providing you with the right amount of proof. Okay, here you see an, a, a very simple example of um, uh, the relationships between variables and how we then uh, would, would, would test it in, in, in reality. If you look at uh, the five um, correlation analysis shown, um, the blue blocks are basically um, reflecting as companies. And um, see Robert on the on the left side in the top, uh, a company which has a very uh, uh, strong correlation between the amount of sales and the amount of um, of people. And if you go to the bottom, then there is a very weak correlation. And then basically the line itself basically is uh, is the regression analysis, and you can basically say that this is the um, the medium around which the companies uh, move. If you then do your analysis, you can uh, uh, basically reflect on, uh, on on companies which are very close to the to the line, which are. Um, and the companies which uh, um, support your um, results uh, the best if you're looking for a uh, perfect correlation. So then moving to the uh, BEPS compliant anchor. So basically, on the basis of the BEPS um, reports, we have um, selected criteria which we use to identify whether the uh, variables and data uh, found from uh, our analysis do meet um, the transfer pricing uh, rules. As reflected in uh, the transfer pricing uh, regulations. So, if you go to the the, the, the steps, um, the first is uh, the quantification should be based on objective data. If the quantification is based on objective data, then we will give it a one. If it is not, then it will basically uh, be given a zero. Then the quantification should be based on comparable data. The same here. Then the quantification should rely on all economically significant functions, asset and risk contributed by the parties to value driver. Also here, um, and then last but not least, there should be a relatively consistent correlation between the variable and the creation of value represented by the relevant profits. So what it does is basically um, looking at what you don't, what we have done on, in the previous uh, assessment. Um, this gives basically an, an, an additional check for us um, to see whether what we have done is is, is correct, yeah, because the data here you are assessing uh, is the data you receive from the from the company. So is the data objective? Yeah, that, that is that is an, uh, a question which you can ask yourself. On are you, I'm looking at plain data? Um, have these data been manipulated or uh, changed for reasons? Uh, have certain allocations already been taken uh, place? Etc. 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 Okay, then um, moving to the next point. And this is about uh, the allocation fees. 
So also the allocation key should be based on objective data. And uh, on the two, allocation key should be supplemented where possible by external market data, indicating how independent enterprise would have divided profits in similar circumstances. Then the key for allocation of profits may be based on the relative contributions of the parties. And allocation key should be should demonstrate a strong correlation between the allocation key and the value created. It all reflects actually also on what we previously discussed, and then uh, you can basically look at your uh, uh, quantitative um, or your quantitative analysis reflected in your benchmarking, and whether that is basically met or not. If these are ranked positively, you can um, uh, use the results you found and apply these then in your uh, in your trend in to assess your transactional uh, uh, methods and, and allocate the, these uh, results you found back to the legal entity based on the allocation fees you have found uh, because they are constituting an uh, allocation keys with a certain degree of, of objectivity. Uh, in that regard, you can distinguish uh, um, three scenarios. Um, it was maybe obvious that uh, the higher the score, um, the more compliant you uh, are. So scenario one, total effort score is close to four. Then you have the quantitative PCA, which is fully objective and BEPS compliant. Quantitative VCA can be applied for change in allocation of profits in the past and a transaction model in the future. Then scenario two, total average score is close to three. Quantitative VCA is reasonable, that's compliant. Quantitative VCA can be applied as a correlative approach for, ch for change in allocation of profits in the transaction model in the future. And then scenario three, total average score is equal or lower than two. Quantitative VCA is not BEPS compliant. Quantitative VCA should not be applied for any change in the allocation of profit in the past or transaction model in the future. Now, this means that uh, if you are in scenario three, then uh, um, your analysis has not been successfully conducted. And, and you, you should just go back to the drawing board. Um, are there any questions? Because I'm um, with this, I'm at the end of the presentation. Um, basically, what we try to do is give you some flavor of what we are uh, working on in terms of uh, quantitative and qualitative value chain analysis. Okay, we have a question from Ruben. Isn't it dangerous to perform regression analysis on eight data points? Uh, now the data points itself are not uh, um, are an example uh, because the, the data points are is, are coming from uh, 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 financial um, information from um, large companies and we selected in this case case eight companies um, depends on the, the on the, the industry this was uh, the data we used here was was uh, automotive if I remember correctly. Uh, and we basically select eight large automotive entities. If you look at another industry, uh, it may be uh, um, necessary to consider the eight, uh, and maybe you need to select more or less, but likely more, because uh, automotive is basically concentrated in uh, um, a certain amount of players, uh, which are not uh, very uh, large. And um, the other thing is, is this, if you look at more smaller players within the automotive market, market, then you are looking at more niche players, which may be less comparable. Like an auto, auto an, an Aston Martin is not the same as a Volkswagen. Um, so that's also why we had uh, we only restricted ourselves to uh, the, the larger ones. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Um, now hopefully we. Uh, we see or hear from you again uh, next time. Thank you very much.